So welcome to this session. Here we are, Caroline and I, and I will give you another wave. The first slide explains that MEDRA came about in the mid-1990s. It was an ICH initiative, and at the time, the MSSO was put in place to maintain and support MEDRA, distributing it. The activities of the MSSO are overseen by a management committee with representatives from across ICH, both the regulatory authorities and the pharmaceutical industry. The second slide is a disclaimer explaining that MEDRA is owned by ICH, as is the material that we're going to use today. So if you ch choose to use um, the material, you'll have access to the recording, but not the slides. But if you do quote anything, you must acknowledge ICH as owners of MEDRA and of the material. I mentioned that we want to make it a participative workshop format, so we'll be using the questions for you to comment or ask questions. Sometimes we may not agree on the term selection, so in the interest of time, we'll need to move on, but we will address your comments as best we can in the time available. We can't take requests to code specific verbatim terms today through the questions, but at the end, there will be an option for you to propose new examples for consideration. But please make sure these are of general interest to the wider audience. This is how you can participate in the polling. So the easiest way is to scan the QR code. Alternatively, you can open an internet browser, either on your computer or your cell phone, type in pollev.com in the URL bar, and enter my name as the username, Jane Knight 855 all one word, the username. It's completely anonymous, but that enables you to link to the presentation. So I'll just leave that for a few seconds for you to get your smartphone and scan it or take a snapshot or enter the credentials, Jane Knight 855. If you lose connection during the session, let us know and we can show the QR code again. So we we'll see some of you are already on it here. Let's see lots of you in Europe, somebody in North America in the United States, welcome probably our regular attendee. Welcome. There, it's someone from India, South Africa. Philippines, Indonesia, South Korea. Indonesia, South Korea. Welcome. Lots in Europe. I can't make out there. Cross Europe. <clears throat> yeah. <Holy>. Spain, Italy. <laughs> welcome. Welcome, welcome to you all. This is the demo credentials for the web-based browser that I mentioned, and there's a screenshot showing you how you can go on the right-hand side of the home page of the website, WBB, and the, here are, Caroline's going to put the credentials in the chat, or if you want I to did. take a snapshot of the screen. Thank I did already. You. Thank you. So now we say when we do coding, I think we are all aware that there may not always be an exact match. Sometimes there's more than one possible approach. Even the points to consider document sometimes offers us options for coding. And it might be that we understand the term differently. We find this when Caroline and I prepare. Sometimes we will have a discussion about a term because we might, it, our initial impression is the different. But the best we can do when terms perhaps are not as clear as we would like them is we do the best we can, best approximation in coding. And overall, we always code as reported. We don't make assumptions and we don't add any information to the reported events. So we always have a picture in these sessions and we say, well, sometimes coding is like this. You're not quite sure what it is you're looking at. This poor lady cycling along and somebody's come, a pavement artist has chalked a picture of a big hole on the pavement, as you see, and it's making her unsteady on her bike. Look, so and we see terms are sometimes like that. Do you see it this way? Is, is it really saying what I think it's meaning? So that's why this is the picture we've chosen for today. So having said all that, so it's a balance of coding rules for consistency, medical judgment to manage the risk to patients, and the rules for consistency. 
medical reference are helpful and we'll you'll see that in the, the examples we present to you today sometimes it may even be necessary to request a new term to be added to medra and we've got one of those examples later on so having said all of that around the challenges in coding let's code together and here i'm going to turn my video off so that it's less distracting for us both so the first example we have is intermittent potassium level too high to start dialysis. So Caroline's going to put this in the chat if you want to see the text. What's actually being reported here? Is it a lab result? Potassium level too high to start dialysis? Is it only a lab result or is there anything more being captured there? Do we need to code the failure to start therapy? And overall, what would be the most appropriate LLT? So that would be my initial evaluation of this term. It looks like a lab result to me. So how would you code it? Let's start with the free text. What do you think of the term? Welcome. Someone's telling us where they are. That links back to the other map question. Welcome from, from Romania. Welcome to you. High potassium level, potassium level increased, the lab results. So you're all with me saying it's a lab result. Somebody says we must also code the, the treatment delayed. Potassium high dialysis related complication. <clears throat> Do we know that it's a dialysis related complication? Because it says they're too high to start dialysis. Have they had dialysis in the past? We're not sure. Someone thinks it's a medical condition and not a lab result. So we've got a difference of opinion here. So let's move on in the interest of time. Hopefully everyone's had chance to vote. Most of you think that it's a potassium level increase, a lab result. But one or two of you think that it's a medical condition, in particular hyperkalemia. So difference of opinion. Well, we did some referencing. We've got this reference here the around dialysate potassium, dialysate magnesium and hemodialysis risk. And this explains we've got it bigger here, the same similar um, similar example, similar. Uh, I think it might even be the same example or a variation of it. And explaining here that one of the fundamental goals of hemodialysis is to maintain serum potassium levels within a narrow normal range during both the intradialytic and interdialytic intervals. And considering the extraordinarily high rate of cardiovascular mortality in hemodialysis population, clinicians are obligated to explore whether factors related to the potassium level can be modified to improve clinical outcomes. So this is what, and it's saying there that potassium can trigger cardiac arrest. So this is referencing that there is a link between high potassium and the, a delay to treatment. So let's browse Medra at this point. I'll move over now to the browser and we'll go here to the web-based browser. There we are, log on with my own credentials. And we can see there that what are we looking for? We're looking for the potassium high. So we, we, we think it's a lab result. So I would start with that one. It's saying it, the potassium level is too high. When I see the word high, I tend to think of a lab result. So that's where I would be going there. I'd be looking for chemistry, chemistry analyses, and we'd be looking for um, potassium or let's go. For, let me go for this one here because it will be it's electrolytes, isn't it? Let me start with this way of doing it. Potassium high because it was too high to start. So let's use the exact wording. What have we got? We've got potassium high as an LLT with blood potassium increased as the PT. That's what some of you were telling us in the poll. And it's mineral and electrolyte analyses. That's where. I should have been looking. So let's have a look at this one. Let's go to browser to just check. Go to browser and it will take us. It's uniaxial because it's a lab result. And we've got all the electrolytes here. Magnesium, phosphorus, blood potassium increased 
and there it is plasma potassium potassium high potassium increased the, these are options llt options you gave me so i think that based on my understanding of the points to consider document that is the better option rather than hyperkalemia but we'll look at that in a moment the other thing is that there was a delay wasn't there there was a delay to treatment because the potassium level was too high. So let's see what we've got. If we type in the word delayed, we've got 132 terms there. So that gives us a lot to look through. Let's try with treatment or therapy. Treatment delayed. Let's start with that one, see if we can find. Treatment delayed is an LLT. Treatment delayed again is the PT. And that's the therapeutic procedure. So again, we can go to browser and look to check there's nothing better alongside of it. There it is. Treatment delayed is the PT. So we would think, and that's the only LLT underneath it. So let's go back to our slides. I mentioned that the points to consider is where I would base my judgment. So based on what's in the points to consider, we're told that if a report is reported as a medical condition, it should be coded as a medical condition. And the example here is hypoglycemia, which is in the Metabolism and Nutrition Disorders SOC. But if an event is reported as a lab result, for example, decreased glucose, it's coded as decreased glucose. So if we apply that principle here, we should code the increase, the high potassium to the high potassium level term. So we would select the closest lab result term. We don't infer a medical condition from a lab result, but don't forget to capture the resulting delay to treatment. And the two terms that we would select are potassium high and treatment delayed. So that's our final su suggestions on that one. Any questions or comments, Caroline, on that example so far? There was one comment um, uh, saying that, stating that dial dialysis is, of course, a treatment for high potassium and uh, that there is a discrepancy in the reported verbatim, but you already explained that um, potassium should also be preserved at an acceptable level uh, in between, between dialysis. Uh, so that's why I think there's no discrepancy if it's too high in order to decrease the risk uh, of, of the patient to suffer cardiac arrest during the dialysis, it should be kept at a, an acceptable level. So that's why I think it's, um, it's, there's no dis discrepancy in the verbatim. It's too high, if it's too, yeah, high, it's to, too high. Management inter and intra, so within the session itself, as well as between sessions, inter, mm -hmm. dialytic and intra. Thank you, Caroline. The next example we're going to present today is peritonitis due to PD. So we've got an abbreviation here, PD. We, we, we're my, our mind is already on dialysis because we've just had the dialysis term. Well, it just, does this mean peritoneal dialysis or could it mean something else? What's being reported? Is it a specific medical condition? Is there a med return perhaps for peritonitis due to a, a procedure like peritoneal dialysis? Do we need to prioritize the information or split code it? And what would we code it to? So again, those are our evaluation questions we ask. Here's a multiple choice for you this time. What would you code it to? Peritonitis, infectious peritonitis, non-infectious peritonitis, chemical peritonitis, perforative, perforative, Peritoneal dialysis, the procedure itself probably needs to be captured if we're happy with the abbreviation, or would you seek clarification? Anyone else going to vote? Few votes still trickling in, I see. Yes, have you had chance to have a read through and have a think? A few of you still voting. It's good to see so many of you voting, so many of you online today. Okay, so let's have a look at the votes so far. So the, the number one choice so far is peritonitis. 
Few of you would seek clarification, and some of you are coding the peritoneal dialysis as well. And then there's just a handful of you have split your choices between infectious or non-infectious, and nobody has selected chemical peritonitis. So let's have a look at some references now to see if we can support it. We'll close the vote with that. Oh, let's browse. I was going to look at my references first, but let's go back and browse. So let's have a look at peritonitis. There's probably not a lot more to find from the ones I gave you as an option, but we could look at the placement of some of these terms. So peritonitis, we've got the LLT peritonitis exact match, and we've actually got 67 terms that include the word peritonitis. So that shows us that it's a good, good idea to check and have a look through these because there might be something there specific to peritoneal dialysis. So there's this term here of chemical peritonitis. We can have a look, there's a PT for that of chemical peritonitis and it has, um, it's multi-axial under the HLT of chemical injuries or peritoneal and retroperitoneal disorders. So chemical, I suppose we could regard the dialysis say, fluid as a chemical, what else? We've got some others here. We've got the infectious peritonitis. Well, I would expect that. It's under a PT of peritonitis. And if I put my cursor on, I can see on the right-hand side, it'll be primary to the infection SOC, which it is. And there is there are the occurrences of it there. It's both in gastrointestinal and as an infection. So we haven't been told that it is infectious or not infectious, but we've been told it's peritonitis. Anything like this about biliary or perforation, that would be adding information. So we don't want anything like that. And we could look through them. So I've shown you those two. In my mind, I think it would probably be between the chemical peritonitis based on the fluid could be considered a chemical or peritonitis, just the plain term, which is an inf infectious term. And then we would also think about checking, has the peritoneal dialysis been captured elsewhere in the case? If not, we might be looking to capture that here. It might be reported as a treatment or in another field of the form, may already be captured. If not, we'd be looking for that. There it is as peritoneal dialysis as a procedural term, renal therapeutic procedures. So let's go back in the interest of time. There we go. So referencing Dorland's is our go-to medical dictionary, although there are many options out there. Peritonitis is defined as the inflammation of the peritoneum with exudative serum, fibrin cells and pus, normally accompanied by abdominal pain and tenderness, constipation, vomiting and moderate fever. Chemical peritonitis is listed as peritonitis due to chemical irritation, such as from peritoneal dialysis or bile leaking out of the intestine. So it mentions peritoneal dialysis there if it's due to chemical irritation. But do we know that just because the patient's having dialysis, that it's necessarily chemical irritation? It could be infectious even, couldn't it? If somebody's got a tube into their peritoneum, it's Im imperative that they keep a very strict aseptic technique with it. And there's a risk that it could be infectious. So it, it could be ke per chemical. We're not exactly sure there. So I did some more research more referencing and found an example here talking again that a peritonitis is a common risk and it can be a severe complication with peritoneal dialysis. They talk there about the International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis Guidelines and they mention use of antibiotics prophylactically or as treatment. So my feeling of this is that firstly, when seeing the term, I would make sure the abbreviations were un unambiguous. You may well know that the patient's already on dialysis. It may be related to the type of clinical trial, and you may have an internal glossary or reference list for the abbreviations. Search for an LLT to capture everything. We didn't find an LLT with the word dialysis and peritonitis together, but my feeling is that we should not make an assumption on the type of peritoneal uh, uh, the type of peritonitis. Capture the peritoneal dialysis, as I mentioned, as a procedure if it's not already captured and rub coded elsewhere. 
And overall, I would take a conservative approach. I would code it to peritonitis and peritoneal dialysis if it hasn't been captured elsewhere. Now, I realize that the chemical was mentioned, but my feeling is that we can't rule out an infection. It could be due to the tube, not necessarily due to chemical irritation. Any thoughts or comments on this one, Caroline? Any questions? Yeah, Ursula is asking uh, whether we are not making assumptions here. Which which part would you think would be an assumption? The PD? The PD, yes, because she, she mentions that PD could relate to progressive disease. Yes, it could well be. So this is why I say here that capture the, if it's already, if you're happy that it is peritoneal dialysis, then you would capture it. But absolutely, with all abbreviations, we make sure that they are unambiguous and you would check check the context of your of your trial or seek clarification. Uh, yes, I, I, I agree with that. I think that's a valid point that you're making there. No if further no further questions. That's what I meant there by if it's considered unambiguous. Okay, well I'll hand over to you then, Caroline, at this point. Okay. Can you see it? Can you see it, Jane? I can see it. Sorry, Caroline, I put myself on okay. mute. Can you make it can you make it whole screen? Is it whole screen? It is whole screen, oh, yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So here, uh, the next verbatim for today. Um, we are told that um, um, the finding of a ureteropelvic junction syndrome. So do we understand what is re being reported here? Um, Based on the wording, are we able to directly code it or do we have to query? And is this a specific medical condition at all? Can we find a suitable term in MEDRA? So how would you approach this verbatim? Ureteral pelvic junction syndrome. Would you code this to pelvic discomfort because syndrome seems to be quite vague or chronic pelvic pain syndrome? or urinary tract discomfort because it's ureter, ureter is mentioned, or would you consider this a congenital condition coding it to congenital ureteral pelvic junction obstruction, or would you keep it vague and code it to ureteric, ureteral pelvic junction obstruction only, missing the congenital aspect, or would you seek clarification because you would consider this as too vague. See that 43 of you have already voted. Let's wait for a minute. So you see on the slide that uh, this poll is completely anonymous. So don't be hesitant, just make your choice. Let's see what we are going for. So some of you would code, most of you would actually code to ureteral pelvic junction obstruction. Others um, would rather see clarification and or consider this as a congenital condition. And some of you would also like to keep it vague and just code to urinary tract discomfort. So let's close the poll. Here we are and look into some references. So here you can see that um, ureteral pelvic junction syndrome can also be called ureteral pelvic junction obstruction. It's considered a synonym. Both are considered synonyms. And you can also see that this syndrome can be primary or secondary. So uh, it may be a congenital condition due to a stricture of the ureter, or it can develop secondary to trauma, growth of scar tissue, or neoplasms later in life. So let's 
switch screens here and check in our browser. So if I search for books, Ureta and pelvic injunction, here we are, in search, we find the congenital ureteropelvic junction obstruction or stenosis. And we have here the, the more vague term. So the congenital condition, of course, when we click on it, you can see it's grouped under SOC congenital and has a secondary linkage to the renal SOC. Where the, the other, the vague term, of course, only has one linkage to renal. These were the two options also in the poll. The assignment of all other LLTs listed in the poll, like pelvic discomfort, chronic pelvic pain syndrome, and urinary tract discomfort would be incorrect. It was not reported that this is a pain syndrome. and No discomfort was mentioned. It was a report of a specific abnormal anatomical finding, and we should capture this anatomical finding, meaning the pelvic obstruction in this instance. Let me switch back. So the, um, the medical term selection points to consider document provides us with some guidance when it comes to conditions that could be either congenital or quiet. And we are told that if a condition is reported without any information describing it as congenital or acquired, that we should, should select the non-qualified term for the condition. And for conditions or diseases existing in both congenital and acquired forms, the following conventions applied in MEDRA, the more common form of the condition disease is represented at the PT level without adding a qualifier of either congenital or acquired. So this is the convention that is used for classification in MEDRA. So what can we learn from this? If you cannot find a direct match when searching in MEDRA, look out for synonyms or quasi-synonyms um, for the reported condition. Check medical references to make sure that similar terms that you could find truly reflect the reported condition. And when a reported condition could be congenital or acquired, then you have the option, of course, to clarify the age of the patient. It really depends on um, the product that you have, whether this is important. This um, distinction is, is important for the safety profile of, of your drug, especially when you have, um, you have only MEDRA terms that are either including the information acquired or congenital, when you have no neutral term then, of course, you, you are forced to, to, to raise a query in order to find out whether the reported condition is acquired or congenital. So in order to code as specifically as possible, we would first try to find out the patient's age. And if no clarification can be obtained, we would code to the LLT ureteral pelvic junction obstruction under PT pelvic ureteric obstruction. So any questions, any related questions, Jane? No questions or comments on that one so far, Caroline. It must just still be sinking in with everyone. Yeah. So here it was easy because we have such a neutral term that perfectly captures the reported condition because we don't know whether this was congenital and acquired or acquired. Okay, next one. An abdominal visceral hyperalgesia is reported here. So do we understand what has been reported? Do we have to split code or can we prioritize the information in some way? And what would be the most appropriate LLT or the most appropriate LLTs? Looking into Dorland's, in order to better understand uh, what is meant by viscera, um, we find that viscous, refers to any large interior organ in one of the three great cavities of the body, meaning the dorsal cavity, which includes the cranial and spinal cavity, and the ventral cavity, 
with the thoracic cavity and the abdominal pelvic cavity. But the term is most frequently used to describe large organ, um, organs of the abdominal cavity. This is also mentioned here, like the liver, spleen, pancreas, etc. So based on what you've just seen, how would you approach this verbatim? Which LRT or which LRTs would you select? Visceral hyperalgesia, hyperalgesia, abdominal pain, just pain. Would you code split code and assign visceral hyperalgesia and abdominal pain? Or would you see clarification? What would you do? All of you are voting now. Let's see. 50 votes already. So let's have a look. So most of you would go for visceral hyperalgesia, uh, but some of you would also split code and assign both visceral hyperalgesia and abdominal pain. And only a small proportion would go for the more general terms or see clarification. So again, let's close this poll and switch screens. Again, here we are. So when I search for the term hyperalgesia alone, here it is, it's a direct match. So it's grouped under hyperesthesia, looks strange. So something, um, this uh, doesn't seem to fit to what has been reported here. So pain again, pain alone would be again too vague because abdominal pain was reported. So let's look for abdominal pain. Here we are and search. It's the same PT. And if I click on it, we can see the hierarchy. It's grouped, of course, under gastrointestinal disorders. And when I now enter, our our reported term, then I also find a perfect match, meaning visceral hyperalgesia that is grouped under PT visceral pain. And if I look into the hierarchy, I see because viscera, as we saw in Dolan's, may refer to any of the main um, body cavities. Um, it has its primary SOC and SOC general, but it has a secondary linkage to gastrointestinal disorders because in most instances, the visceral pain is referring to the abdominal cavity. So we see that the secondary linkage of this term really captures the abdominal localization of the pain. So, um, we, in my view, no clarification is needed for the given verbatim because we have found a perfect match in MEDRA with the LLT visceral hyperalgesia. So, in this context, please remember the guidance in the MEDRA term selection points to consider document regarding split coding. Splitting should only be performed when more relevant medical information needs to be captured. And the example provided is a reported tumor type with its associated genetic marker. If no suitable combination term can be found, then split coding would be necessary for similar terms because, of course, the genetic markers are relevant both um, for the etiology, prognosis, and therapy of the tumors. And a separate chapter then addresses combination terms which include both the affected body site and the description of the specific event. And it is stated that when no suitable combination term is available, the event information generally has priority. 
So in our case, it would be the visceral pain. So the pain of these uh, organs of um, the body cavities. We would look, first look for a combination term that's clear, which would capture all reported information. But when no such combination term can be found, we can also take the SOC linkages of potentially suitable terms as guidance and check whether the given anatomical site is captured by a secondary SOC linkage. And we saw that the PT visceral pain has a secondary linkage to the SOC gastrointestinal. And these secondary SOCs can be used for subsequent data and analysis. We are not missing relevant information when assigning this LLT and PT. Splitting is not required in this instance because no further relevant medical information can be captured by selecting LLT abdominal pain in addition. Remember the guidance in the PTC document. If no combination term can be found that would capture both the affected site and the specific event, then the specific event has priority. And in our example, pain of large internal organs was reported this is the specific event and the affected body site, the abdomen, is captured by a secondary SOC linkage. And here our final suggestion, we would code to LLT visceral hyperalgesia under PT visceral pain. Any questions, Jane? No, Caroline, no comments or questions at all. We have a silent audience today. Silent, yes. <laughs> no. Please raise questions if something is unclear or whether when you have a different opinion on, on some of our suggestions, just let us know so that we can start a discussion about how we approach this um, specific verbatim. Otherwise, let's continue. Next one. A 60-year-old healthy patient missed his appointment for the second dose of his primary mRNA COVID-19 vaccine series. He suffered severe COVID-19 abroad. Is this verbatim again? Is it clear and concise? Does it represent a med medication error or something else? And is split coding needed here? Which allergies would you select? Jane has put this into um, the chat because the verbatim was too long in order to put it into Poll Everywhere. You wouldn't see the suggested LLT assignments. 60-year-old healthy patient missed his appointment for the second dose of his primary vaccine series. He suffered severe COVID-19 abroad. Would you code to incomplete course of vaccination, delayed dose administration, missed dose in error, intentional misuse, intentional dose omission, COVID-19, or breakthrough COVID-19? What would you be your preferences? More than one LT can be selected here. More than 100 votes received already. Let's have a look. You are going for COVID-19. Some of you also for breakthrough COVID-19, also for the incomplete course of vaccination, but we have split of opinions here. Delayed dose administration, missed dose and error, and intentional dose omission would also be options for some of you. So let me close the poll. And, um, one of the options in the poll was the LLT breakthrough COVID-19. So the reference shows that the definition of the term um, vaccine breakthrough case is defined as instance in which an individual is tested positive for COVID-19 after being fully vaccinated. So more than 14 days after completing the primary series. So this is not the case in our, in our instance. 
um, this, our patient was not fully vaccinated. He did not receive the second dose of his primary series. So let's again browse Medra and see what, what we have. So delayed dose administration is of course You will, of course, find a related LLT in Medra, delayed dose administration. Here it is, inappropriate schedule of product administration. If I go right mouse click, go to browser, here we have the delayed dose administration under PT, inappropriate schedule of product administration. But this would be an assumption because we even don't, it is, we are not told that uh, the dose administration was too late, that the vaccine was administered too late. We are only to told that the patient received his first dose, but then missed his second appointment and then suffered COVID-19. So it would be an assumption. It is not reported that the second dose was delayed. Missed dose in error was this another option. Drug dose omission in error. Let's take this one, go to browser again. Here we are. Product dose omission in error. There is no vaccine term, so you could either use product dose omission in error or drug dose omission in error, depending on your coding conventions, whether you consider the vaccine as a drug. Um, so this is, um, would be an option, but again, it would be an assumption because it could have been intentional. Yeah, the patient may have planned a vacation and uh, didn't want to, to, to postpone his medication because it was already, everything was booked. So he did it on purpose. Then it would be an intentional um, dose omission. And we, of course, we also have such a term in Medra. Here it is, intentional dose omission. If I go to the browser, you see it's grouped under a separate HLGT, not, not under HLGT medication errors and other product use errors and issues, but under HLGT off-label uses and intentional product misuses, use issues. The intentional dose omission is here, same PT, vaccine, dose omission by medical indication. There was no medical indication for this dose omission. We only know that, um, that the, the patient um, did not receive his second dose and that he then suffered um, COVID-19 abroad. So maybe he was traveling, maybe it was a vacation, maybe, maybe it was a business trip, we don't know. Um, so again, this would be an, an assumption and the same holds true for the uh, product misuses, intentional product misuse. By dose change, dose duration, there's no, no uh, term that would capture a dose omission. Drug misuse, let's look into the Medra concept descriptions, you find them here. That is product name confusion, drug misuse. Let me check whether it is under product misuse or drug misuse or just misuse. Here it is misuse. For the purposes of term selection and an analysis of Medra coded data, misuse is the intentional use for a therapeutic purpose by a patient or consumer of a product over the counter or prescription other than as prescribed or not in accordance with the authorized product information. Again, um, we cannot um, interpret what has been reported in our case as a misuse because we don't know whether this was for therapeutic purposes. Uh, maybe the patient fell ill and um, the, the dose had had to be second dose had to be postponed. It is not reported. So um, 
again, this would be an interpretation, addition of information, and this uh, is, of course, a principal MEDRA rule code as reported. Do not add information, do not omit relevant medical information. We would need to look for a neutral term, so to say neutral term. And one of these neutral terms was provided in the poll as well. It is incomplete course of vaccination. Again, go to browser and you can see it's again under product administration errors and issues. It's a neutral term. It does not contain the information whether this was accidental or intentional. It's a use issue term and it's very specific to what um, was, re was reported in our case. And we would of course also then code the consequence of the fact that the patient missed his appointment for the second dose and code to COVID-19. Here it is, COVID-19, same PT, and of course, here we see the, uh, the hierarchy as well. It's grouped under viral lower respiratory tract infections, secondary linkage to respiratory, primary, of course, to infections and infestation under HLGT viral infectious disorders. Let me switch back. Remember that we should always code as reported, not adding information, not omitting medically relevant information. This is the basic principle metro coding rule. If we get a such um, a vague report for a dose omission, we should search for the most specific product use issue term. Here it was an mRNA COVID-19 vaccine and the second dose of the primary series was missed, meaning that the vaccination series was incomplete. And we should of course also capture the subsequent COVID-19 infection of the patient. So we would code to incomplete course of vaccination, the same PT and split code in order to capture um, the COVID-19 infection of the patient that um, by assigning LLT COVID-19, same PT as again. Any questions, Jane? Yes, Caroline, there's a couple of comments. So a couple of our group today, David and Martin, both agree with you that the intention mustn't be assumed. So that's the first point. And then we've got a few suggestions. So there's a couple of our group are suggesting vaccine dose omission, but I'm not seeing that in my browser. So as an LLT, vaccine dose omission. Yes. So can you look for that one? A couple of people have suggested that one. And then there's a comment that incomplete course is not the same as missed dose. Incomplete course mean that, may mean that at this point in time, the second shot is not yet due. But we're, although we've been told that he missed it, haven't we? So I think the group are wanting to find some term which says more about omission and missed. Yeah, so there is a vaccine dose omission. It's grouped under PT product dose omission issue. But this is, of course, more vague. Let me check vaccine that. Vaccine dose omission. They think that's closer yeah. to... They product dose omission is, is, is fine, but, um, you know, the, the patient has missed his second appointment. So he has missed it. So that's why we can assume, usually in safety, you take the worst case approach. I would consider this an incomplete course of vaccination because he missed his second dose, because he did not visit his doctor. He was abroad. We don't know for vacation or whatsoever, whether he missed it in error, whether it was intentional, uh, no idea. So I agree, the vaccine dose omission seems to be suitable because it's a neutral term, does not convey an intention or uh, an error. But um, I consider the incomplete course of vaccination as more specific because it uh, refers to the vaccines. 
And what about a combination? There's a suggestion that what about doing vaccine dose omission and then also vaccination second dose? So you're, cap you're capturing what was omitted. But then yeah. if vaccination second dose, does that mean that the vaccination was given? A vaccine, a vaccine second dose, in my view, would, uh, would, would mean that the second um, vac uh, dose was given. Yeah. yeah, and I would first I would always look for for one combination term that would capture all um, information that was reported, and the vaccine dose omission, both the vaccine dose omission and um, incomplete course of vaccination seem to um, capture the fact, the the scenario that was reported. But in my view, the um, the incomplete course of vaccination is more specific because it really conveys the fact that the patient missed his appointment for the second dose of his primary series. Yes. So the series was incomplete and um, then suffered COVID-19 abroad. So it was, it, I'm sure that he will not get, he didn't get his second dose at, at, at that uh, because of the COVID-19 infection because uh, if you if you suffer COVID-19, you have to wait a certain amount of time, depending on on the product, several months um, <clears throat> before you could get um, a, a new um, a new vaccine dose. So for me, vaccine incomplete course of um, vaccination um, is the the most specific term in this instance. And. Martin saying to Caroline, the differences are subtle and wouldn't make a difference in signal detection. So I yes, think that's a good approach. This might be one where slight differences of opinion, but in I could I personally I could see it from either direction. You're using your judgment that way, but um thank you, Martin. So kind of saying in the big yeah. the big scheme of things, it doesn't matter too much. Um, and yeah. Ursula is saying the incomplete course of vaccination also captures the fact that the patient seemed to have received a first dose, which is not captured by the vaccine dose omission. That, that's, the, that's an interesting point. Yes, by incomplete, yeah. you're saying they started and they didn't have it, whereas just saying mm -hmm. they omitted it, they may have omitted the first one. So, yeah, yeah. That, that's a good, that's a different perspective. Good argument. Point. Yeah, that's what I mean with that the incomplete course of vaccination yeah, is more specific. So I've got another suggestion for you, Carol Ann, related to this one, related to the COVID. What about travel associated, oh, let me find it, travel associated COVID-19 exposure? Um, it was not an exposure. Um, we don't know whether the, the patient got it um, on um, already when still being at home and then uh, it only became um, clinical um, in, in abroad. Yes. No idea. So that's why, it, again, it would be an assumption. Yes, that's exactly what I said in the text. So thank you. Yeah. We're aligned. <laughs> All the comments and questions on that one, Carol Ann. So if you want to move on, thank you. Thank you all for your input. So here we are with our final suggestions. So next one. Here we um, have a different scenario. A pharmacist reports that there is a risk for errors because the labeling on primary and booster COVID-19 vaccine containers is confusing and also the cap colors are similar. So do we understand whether this is a product quality issue or a medication error or something else? And is splitting necessary to capture the full information? What do you think? How would you approach this verbatim now? Again, Jane will put it on in the chat because it's too long to put it into Paul Everywhere, into the application. Pharmacist reports that there is a risk for errors because the labeling on primary and booster COVID-19 vaccine containers is confusing and also the cap colors are similar. Intercepted product administration error, product administration error, circumstance or information capable of leading to medication error, product label issue, 
packaging design issue, <coughs> excuse me, product label confusion, or lookalike packaging? What would be your choice? What would be the LLT or what would be the LLTs that you would select? See, you are still voting. Nearly 100 votes received now. Now we are with, with 100. Let's have a look. Circumstance or information capable of leading to medication error. Most of you, many of you have voting, voted for this. Lookalike pet packaging, product label confusion, packaging design issue, product label issue or intercepted product administration error. So we, we have split of, of opinions here. Let's, let me close the poll. So does the reported incident re represent a product quality issue? The PTC companion document addresses product quality issues and provides a definition. They are defined as abnormalities, also known as non-conformances, so meaning failures to conform with established product specifications that may be introduced in any phase of the supply chain. These include the manufacturing, labeling, packaging, shipping, handling, or storage of products. And we are provided with some examples here. When the patient removed the medication bottle from the carton, the temper evidence seal was absent, so a clear product quality issue product container seal issue. On inspection of a medication bottle, a customer noticed that the child resistant cap didn't work. So again, a product issue, product quality issue. Of course, this child resistant cap should work based on the product specifications. The nurse noticed that the blister package was not completely sealed. Again, product blisters pack packaging separated would be the correct LLT here. And a woman reported that her contraceptive medication was missing the placebo tablets. So some tablets were missing in the blister. Again, package dosage units missing. So all of these are clearly product quality issues. But our verbatim doesn't describe product quality issues but the risk of for a medication error based on confusing labeling of primary and booster COVID-19 vaccines and also confusing cap colors of its containers, so parts of the packaging. Let me again switch to the browser here. So what did we have? Intercepted administration error. Here we are. Intercepted drug administration error. Let's go to browser. Here we are. Drug administration error, product administration error. So what does it mean? Um, such terms, similar terms, would be assigned for situations where medication error occurred, so a medication error occurred during any earlier stage in the medication process, in this instance, vaccination process, like prescribing or dispensing, but it didn't reach the patient because it was intercepted from reaching the patient by a third party. It's not applicable to our coding scenario because no medication error occurred yet. So these intercepted, again, we could look for the concept description here under intercepted medication error. An intercepted medication error refers to the situation where a medication error has occurred but is prevented from reaching the patient or consumer. The intercepted error term should reflect the stage at which the error occurred rather than the stage at which it was intercepted. So this is not applicable to our verbatim. 
product administration error, of course, we would find a suitable LLT here, but it's not applicable again to our verbatim because no administration error was reported, only circumstances which could lead to an administration error. And that is why assignment of circumstance, let me look for these terms to show you. Here, yes, circumstance or information capable of leading to device use error or circumstance or information capable of leading to medication errors. These are the PTs, LLTs and PTs that you would use in order to signal um, the risk of a future medication error that did not occur yet. So this is relevant for data analysis purposes. Whenever you have such a term, you see there's a risk for medication error and you would of course um, um, then also capture the reasons for a potential medication error. We had some votes for product label issue. And if I search for this term, you can already see that it's grouped in product label issues. Here we are under product issues. So, and it has only one linkage to product issues. It's considered a pure product quality term. And if I go to the browser, you see carton label issue, product leaflet text wrong, uh, product package insert incorrect, product package, package insert missing, wrong text. So these are the product label issues. So very specific terms that truly relate to the quality issue of the label. And um, product design issue was the other term in the poll, same story. You will see if I click on it, we have it here. Here's the hierarchy. Again, it's also considered a product issue, a product quality issue. And that's why it's always important that you check the metro hierarchy if you're not too familiar with the, with the terms that are selected by the browser. In, in, in the in the search for the search results. So now the last two LLT options we had um, the term with label confusion. Here we are product label confusion. If I go to the browser, we see that we are again in um, in the HLGT medication errors and other product use errors and issues under the HLT product confusion errors and issues. Here is the product label confusion and you see terms like drug label lookalike, expiration date format confusion, patient instructions for use in label confusing, um, product leaflet instruction confusion. So these are the terms here and these are really close to what has been reported in our case. We do not exactly know why the label was confusing um, of, of the booster vaccines and, and uh, the, the vaccines for the primary series, but at least based on what we see here um, under this PT, we, we know that this is exactly reflecting what has been reported in our case. And we also, we know that um, the caps of the containers um, was confusing because uh, they had similar colors. So this would be a product packaging confusion. Lookalike packaging is the closest match here. Lookalike because the caps had a similar color, so they looked alike. Um, we don't have more specific terms for the specific part of the packaging, but this would um, be the closest match to what has been reported here. So again, let me show some concept description. Here we have 
the product label confusion, for instance, um, is a misinterpretation of the appearance and or content of a product label, which may potentially result in a medication error. This may be due to similarity with another's product label or due to confusing information on a single product label. And um, so this is close to what has been reported in our case. And here is the packaging confusion, misinterpretation of the appearance of um, a product's packaging, which may potentially, potentially result in a medication error. This may be due to similarity with the appearance of another's product packaging or due to confusing appearance or presentation of a single product's packaging. So again, this uh, definitely is close to what has been reported in, in our case, in our verbatim. Again, we have some uh, a reminder of, of, of the concept descriptions that we that um, I've just shown. And the learning points for this verbatim are that it is important to clearly distinguish between product quality issues and medication errors and issues. And if you're not too familiar with these topics, check the PTC companion document and the MEDOR concept descriptions because you will find very detailed guidance there and a lot of useful practical examples. And when confronted with similar coding scenarios where only the risk of a device use or medication error is reported, signal this risk with the selection of either LLT and PT circumstance or information capable of leading to medication error or LLT and PT circumstance or information capable of leading to device use error. And code, of course, the factors that may potentially cause the medication or device use error in addition. You may ask yourselves why some regulators want to receive this information, why it is um, necessary at all to capture this information. Well, we, we when understanding the background for these potential errors, regulators and also pharma can already take steps to prevent errors before even happening. So depending on your local requirements, do not omit such details, but capture all relevant information when receiving similar verbatims and code both the potential for an error and also the contributing factor or factors. And here again, the final suggestions, we would quote to circumstance or information capable of leading to medication error, same PT, to LLT product label confusion, same PT, and LLT lookalike packaging under PT product packaging confusion. Any questions, Jane? Um, they, let's just try this on. Lookalike packaging and label confusion are going to the same HLT product confusion errors and issues. Does this justify to capture one event for this scenario rather than selecting two PTs if they're going to the same HLT? No, this, uh, this rule is only applicable when you have two LLTs that link to the same PT. But if um, um, a certain incident or medical concept is represented by two separate PTs, then you would always split code. You know, that's also a basic MEDRA rule. So you would not just select an, uh, an LRT that uh, reflects the HLT name. It's important to really capture this information because you may, of course, marketing uh, before marketing, marketing uh, a drug, marketing, the marketing department will check other packaging, um, product packagings or names whatsoever in order to avoid such confusion. But it's only when a product is marketed, when you then really can find out whether there is some product on the market that has a similar name or similar packaging whatsoever that could really cause confusion and subsequently medication errors. So that's why um, regulators are really interested 
in receiving such information and on a very detailed basis because they want to take action on it in order to avoid these errors even before it has happening. Another comment, but the product packaging confusion is a narrow term in the medication errors SMQ. Yes, because it could lead to a uh, to to a medication error. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you you could of course if you if you select the circumstance or information capable of leading to medication error. In addition, this then signals that no medication error occurred yet. If you would just assign look-alike packaging, this could, of course, lead to a medication error, to an administration error, wrong product administered, for instance, or wrong dose administered, whatsoever. So that's why it's a narrow term in the SMQ. It really depends on the additional, if there's an additional assignment of this LRT, whether this can be considered um, a true medication error, yes or no, but you would, of course, like to um, retrieve such cases in order to verify whether uh, a medication error occurred because of the confusion. And the last comment, are packaging and label, do they have the same meaning? Packaging and label don't have the same meaning. So the label is the etiquette that you have on the container containing the product information, and it also refers to, to the product insert, whereas the packaging is either the external packaging or the primary container of the medication or, or any medicinal product. Okay, that's all the questions and comments. Thank you, Caroline. Okay, then I hand it back to you, Jane. Back, yeah. Thank you. Uh... Okay, so the next example is the doctor administered the COVID-19 vaccine to a three-month-old baby, and we're told in parentheses this is not covered by the label. The doctor administered the COVID-19 vaccine to a three-month-old baby, which is not covered by the label. So do we understand what's being reported here? We've been talking a lot about intention, haven't we? So that's what goes through my mind initially. Is this reporting a medication error, a product use issue, or an off-label use. So in other words, was it an error or was it some other kind of issue? Maybe was it intentional or not? Do we need to split code it? And what would be the most appropriate LLT? So what would you code this to? Doc, I've given you the term on the page here and a small selection. We've got off-label use for unapproved age group, inappropriate age at vaccine administration, Drug prescribed for unapproved age group, intentional product use in unapproved age group, or a product administration error. So it all comes down to intention again, doesn't it, with these medication error type terms or product use issue terms. Are you voting? I can see the numbers are clicking upwards. How are we doing here? Let's see where your thoughts lie. Most popular choice so far is off-label use for unapproved age group. So because it's mentioned in brackets not covered by the label, a number of you are thinking that this is off-label. Some of you, however, are going for inappropriate age at vaccine administration without, without um, making the call that it's off-label. Drug prescribed for unapproved age group, well, prescription, but we're told that it was actually administered, so we can probably look for an administration term. And intentional product use in unapproved age group, well, again, looking at the intention or product administration error, which is very general. So this is where your final votes are. Number one choice is off-label use. So let's look at that verbatim. Doctor administered the COVID-19 vaccine to a three-month-old baby not covered by label. So this is our 
training flow chart we use for medication errors. And this is a good starting point. The first question we ask is, is it intentional or accidental? Do we know that here? Just because the doctor gave the drug, we don't know that it was deliberate and off label. It could have been an accident. So is it intentional or not? Is it by the healthcare provider? Well, we don't know that it's intentional. If it is intentional and, and it is for therapeutic intention, that's the criteria for off-label use, that it's intentional, it's by a healthcare provider, and it's meant for therapeutic intention. But we haven't been told that it's intentional. All we've been told is that it's been given. It could also be intentional and given by, it could be due to the health by the patient or consumer. And if for therapeutic, that would be considered an intentional product misuse. But if it was not for therapeutic, that would be abuse or dependence. And if you don't know, and accidental, if it's accidental and you're told it's accidental, it could be either by the healthcare provider or by the patient consumer. And if it is for therapeutic intention and it's an accident, that's what constitutes a medication error. But in this scenario, we don't know the intention. So it, it, it could be that we don't know. In our case, it's the doctor we don't know. Or it could be by a healthcare, by a patient that it's we don't know their intention. If it's by a patient or consumer, it then becomes intention un, intentional product use issue because they've done something intentionally and you don't know if it's therapeutic or not, then if you know it's intentional, it's an intentional product use issue. And if you don't know if it's intentional or not, that's the one we want. We don't know that this doctor did it intentionally. Just because it was not covered by the label, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily off-label use. It could have been an error. So we have to code it to some kind of product use issue term. So let's browse Medra for this then. So we can browse, we can look for it. We know that it's the age, don't we? We can, um, let's do this one. So we've got vaccine, vaccine and age, it was the wrong age of the patient. So let's start with those two to see. Vaccination, inappropriate age at vaccine administration. This is product administered to patients of inappropriate age. Well, that seems to be what's actually been reported. It would be an assumption to say that it's off label. It would be an assumption to say that it was an intentional use for unapproved age group. So this one is the one that I think is going to be the closest we can find. It all hinges on the intention, whether it was a deliberate off label use or not. I wouldn't choose the one which was drug prescribed for an approved age group because we know that it's actually been administered. So product administered to patients of an inappropriate age. You've got adult use of a child product. Child product given to infant is another option there. So what was our term? COVID vaccine given to a baby. Uh, three month old, so we might, but we don't know that it's a child product. So we all we know is we have today, it would be inappropriate to select off label use. So our learning points are that we should clearly distinguish the concepts of an unauthorized product use and understand how to use the corresponding LLTs and PTs. We should always refer to the points to consider document and the points to consider companion document for further guidance. And you can search for the most specific LLTs in the three HLGTs that you find within the injury and poisoning um, system organ class, medication errors and other product use errors and issues, off-label uses and intentional product misuses, use issues, or overdoses and underdoses. And we can go back to the browser and have a look to show you those. We usually advise people to do a top-down search. So you would do your top-down by opening injury, poisoning and procedural complications, looking at medication errors and other product use errors and issues. So remember this, this HLGT is not just medication errors. You've got the product use issues in there as well. 
And this is the HLTs that we've mentioned, product administration errors and issues, medication errors, product use errors and issues. And so we know it was administered. And this is where you've got these details of the administration, not necessarily the intention saying that it was intentional or not. And then you've got these errors and issues. Down here, you've got the off-label terms separated in the separate HLGT. You've got the off-label uses and intentional product misuses. So this is what we mean by if you don't know that it was intentional, you don't go near this HLGT. You just select the closest term from one of these terms here, as we've just done. So the final suggestion is inappropriate age at vaccine administration, pay product administered to patients of inappropriate age. OK, any comments or questions on that one, Carol Ann? No comments, no questions, yeah. Jane. Yeah. So let's try this next one, because this is a suggestion from one of our regular attendees in the group, hyperparasitemia. What is being reported? Do we need to query this? Hyperparasitemia. Is it a medical condition or a lab result? Well, to me, hyper and emia look like it's a medical condition. Emia, presence of something in the blood. But hyperparasite looks like it's a high parasite level. Is it an infection term? What would be the most appropriate LLT? How would you code this one? I've selected a few for you there. Infection parasitic, parasitosis, hematological infection, septicemia, parasite blood test positive or blood culture positive. What do we have here? Is it, we're back to that question we had earlier on, aren't we? Is it a medical condition or is it a lab result? And it's a parasite related term. Parasite, well, I assume parasitemia. I, when I used to train coders, I would advise them to break the words down. And so here you've got hyper, high, Parasite, parasite, and then emia, let presence in the blood, blood related term. So if you put it together, that's what you'd end up with. So is it parasitosis or parasite blood test positive? Let's see where your choices are. Infection parasitic is a popular choice along with parasitosis. So capturing the infection. But 45% of you looks like just more of you tipping over there. More of you are going for an infection term rather than a parasite blood test positive. But that seems to be the split main between the two options. So that's the final. We'll lock the poll. Parasite blood test positive or either infection parasitic and parasitosis. Well, we'll have a look in the browser in a moment and see where those terms lie. Hyperparasitemia in Dorland's is defined as excessive parasitemia. Well, yes. And parasitemia is the presence of parasites in the blood, such as malarial parasites or other protozoa. So it's a level of parasites in the blood, which suggests it's an infection term rather than a high blood level term. Remember the example we showed you from the points to consider that distinguished between high blood glucose high and hypo or hyperglycemia. So um, it was a decrease, wasn't it? So let's have a look at our parasite. Well, let's go to the infection SOC. We can do it top down this one. I often go wrong when I try to do this in the set in the on the spot in the training. But let's have a look what we've got. Infections breaks down by the organism at the HLGT. So we can go down. We've got protozoal, mycobacterial, fungal, ectoparasitic. So let's have a look at ectoparasitic disorder infections. What have we got here? No, that's not right. Protozoal. What have we got here? Parasites, no. Where are we going? Pathogen unspecified. We need a parasite term. 
Oh, I'm going to go back to where I was. Parasite infection. Let's have a look for that. It'll be a lot quicker than me struggling to find the terms. So here we go. We've got 35 terms that include the word parasite and infection. A lot of these are non-current LLTs. There's the term infection parasitic that we had. It's a PT as well. It's in infections NEC. So that's where it is. It isn't, it isn't separated by pathogen with that one. That's why I wasn't finding it. Infection parasitic, there it is. It's under, para and parasitosis is an LLT under the same PT. So that's a synonym for it. So although your choices were split, more of you were opting for the infection option in one of these two terms. The other option would be, as you saw, you suggested, putting it as an infection term. But if we think back to what we saw in the points to consider earlier on, that would, that's not the guidance that's given. So the points to consider guidance, and we already showed you that earlier on coding of conditions versus test results, is that you would follow the guidance. And if it's reported as a, a medical condition, so emia and hyper, both make me think it's a medical condition report, I'd be looking for an infection. Reference the reported event to ensure full understanding and search for the closest LLT that would capture this parasitic infection. But if we have a look, if we think about other similar terms, we have terms like bacteremia and viremia, don't we? Viremia is one that we would have in already. Many of viremia terms, as well as viremia NOS and just the unqualified term, and the same with bacteremia. So why would we not have a parasite equivalent term? So what we can do, let's have a look and see if the request has been processed. I've switched my browser now to the supplemental view, which is going to show me any terms which have been requested for addition to the new release. And there it is, hyperparasitemia. It was requested. It's been added as a new PT. It's under protozoal infections and it's there under infections and infestations. So this is where I was looking, but it wasn't there because it hadn't yet been added. But there it is, ready for release in version 26.0 26 in March next year. So a good example there. Thank you for that suggestion for us to present. Our final choice in the absence of another term would be infection parasitic or parasitosis. You could select either of those and the change request was submitted. So any comments on that one, Caroline? I see we're at 10.32 here, so I think we're unfortunate, but I think we're going to have to stop at this point. We've done nine of our examples today, which gives us three more to carry over to the new year. Any questions or comments? No, no questions, no, no comments, Jane. Okay, well, I won't whiz through the slides. Let me take you straight on to our quick poll at the end here. We've got some rheumatoid arthritis terms. Hopefully you'll join us again in the new year for our next session. I know that we always are over ambitious. Um, we have, uh, I've got a screenshot here just showing you where the YouTube playlist is stored. It's on our YouTube channel under Medra MSSO in the YouTube channel. You can find all the sessions going back now over two years that we've been covering. And there's also on our training page of our website, there's an index document where you can look at all the verbatim terms that were covered and you can look through them and select which recording you want to watch based on the verbatims that you may be most interested in. So I'm now going to open the poll. This is a quick instant poll for you to give us suggestions of future topics or verbatim terms that you'd like us to cover in future events. Um, also, you can tell us what you thought of the session today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Apologies that it's sometimes difficult to allow the right amount of time for each example, especially when we get comments and discussion, which we like. 
I'll leave you doing that. And at this point, I'm just going to go back to the browser, um, back to the website briefly, because there was a question about how, where do we find the points to consider documents. So you can find the points to consider documents either up here at the top in these quick links where you've got the browser. You've also got the points to consider or you can find the points to consider under how to use you do um, how to use, click on that, support documentation, and you've got a banner here, which has got the points to consider documents in it. So we've been talking about points to consider. We hadn't shown you where they were, so that's one thing I wanted to show you there. And I'll also go to the YouTube channel to just give you a quick show of where to find the YouTube. Oh, no, I was going to show you the... Um, index that's what i was going to show you training materials under the training banner on the website and you look down here coding you've got coding basics advanced and then you've got let's code together and there's a term index and a document explaining how to use the term index the term index document shows you ex all of the terms that we've been covering so if you are and they're grouped according to the categories the way we've given we've given them by clinical therapeutic area um, as well as at the top of the document you can search by date there we are so you can have a look on each occasion which verbatims we covered sometimes we cover 10 nine seems to be quite common nine in a session so I think that's everything. I'll go back to my slides. Just leaves us to wish everyone a very happy end of year festivities. Um, there's our, with, you're doing your um, polling. Thank you for that. And there's a few contacts for you. We, if you've got questions, feel free to follow up with us via the help desk. If you've got suggestions for future terms, there's the links there for the browser. The link we gave you will be valid until the end of the week. The link for the support documentation and the change request option. This is how you can contact us via our website. And thank you very much for your participation and your interactions today. So, yes, it's coming to the end of the year. So wh wherever you are in the world and whatever holidays you have coming up, I hope you have a very happy end of the year celebrations and all the best to you for the new year. It's been lovely doing these sessions over the year with you too, Carol Ann. We've had fun. So thank you. <laughs> like always, Jane, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.